I went to the early morning service, um, and I wasn't quiet when I left. In fact, I kept forgetting things, and I had to go back into the bedroom several times. So I want to publicly apologize to Mrs. Pinner for that. And now, because I've apologized in front of everyone, now, you see, Julia, my wife's not like you. She's very forgiving. <laughs> now, for the, for the talk this morning, uh, we're going to do it slightly, slightly different. I've got some, uh, I've got some props with me. And uh, if you've come this morning expecting just to sit back and relax and enjoy the talk and not have to participate, I'd leave now um, because you're actually going to have to participate. Now, I'm going to say to the children first, I'm going to ask you to come up and help me. And if you come up and help me, there will be something nice in it for you each time. But if you fail to come up, I will pass that on to one of the adults. Okay? So, oh no, I don't need you yet. That's fine. You can, not quite yet. Not quite yet. You can go sit down just for a minute. When I call, see, look, that's enthusiasm, isn't it? Adults, you don't stand a chance this morning. Now, in, uh, under my tea towel, I've got two purple sort of items. I have a purple egg. Um, and in Christchurch, we call these Easter eggs. Uh, we've ke- we're keeping the Easter in Easter. And uh, we've also got in here, for those uh, children that helped me, um, some of these that we made earlier at uh, Mother's Day, um, we have some bars of, bars of chocolate. But inside the egg are a number of different items. Um, and each item you can, you'll see will come out of the egg, and there will be also a, a corresponding slide with it. So I'm going to put the egg on here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Justin, you, can you come up and take the first item out of the egg? Is that all right? Thank you. Now, they're all numbered. Now, we've got to look. Can you see number one in there anywhere? What do you reckon? Do you reckon? Oh, that's number one. Can you take that one out? That's number one. And can you hold it up so everybody can kind of almost, almost see it? And the slide will come up corresponding with it. Fantastic. Now, did you want chocolate? Or do you want me to give it to somebody else? You'll have it. Do you want mum to have it? No? No. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. Now, you can sit down again. Thank you, Justin. Inside here are some five pence pieces. Yeah, I, don't even, I don't have silver, um, but I do have lots of five Ps in a little tin uh, in my office. How many, how many pieces in here do you think? 30. 30. Now we're going to read together that verse. Okay, the count of three. You ready? One, two, three. Judas agrees to betray Jesus. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests and asked, how much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. Now, I want you to imagine the scene. You've known Jesus for a long, long time. You've followed him around. You've you've got to know him. But then Satan, didn't he? He entered Judas, and Judas betrayed him for, for 30 pieces of silver. Now, they probably would have been in a nice little bag, um, which, have you ever seen the film A Passion? They're in like a leather pouch, and when they throw them, they kind of just spread all, all over the floor. But we often give Judas a hard time, don't we? We kind of think, oh, I would never, ever betray Jesus. You know, I would never, no, certainly not for, for money. But as I was preparing this, it got me thinking, I wonder how many times we don't stand up for Jesus when we have an opportunity to talk about him. Now, for some of you, it might be at school, some of you, it might be college, it might be at home, it might be at a club that we're part of, it could be at the local supermarket, it could be in so many places when we have the ideal opportunity to talk about Jesus, but we don't. We don't take it. We decide that, oh, no, they might not, I don't know how they'll take it, or oh, it's not politically correct to talk about faith, you know, that's, that's a real personal thing. But we, cannot, we can actually betray Jesus numerous times in a week. And yet we're very quick to condemn Judas because of what he did. And yes, what he did was dreadful. It really was. But we need to be taking every opportunity we can to share Jesus when we get that opportunity. Because one day, that it's, not, it's going to be too late. People are going to miss out because we might have been the one that was meant to share Jesus with them. And if we don't take that opportunity, we may have been the one that God had appointed to do that. So my ch- one of the challenges for you this morning is when you get that opportunity to share your faith, to talk about Jesus... Just take it. And lots of people say, oh, well, I'm not an evangelist. I I, I can't do that sort of thing. We can all do it. Okay? Some people, it comes really, really naturally and easy. If you see uh, people like J. John and and Mike Pilavachi and some of these people who are fantastic evangelists, yes, for them it's really, really easy. Some of us will be building a sweat up and we'll be nervous and we'll be finding it difficult, but we need to do it. Yeah? Don't shy away from it. You've got the opportunity to talk about your faith, to share Jesus do it. 
It's something we can, we can all do. Now, which child's going to be, come on, do get number two for me. I'm going to, someone else come and get number two. All right, Joshua, up you come. Okay, can you, can you find number two in there for me, please? You just moved it. It's that one. Fantastic. Can you hold it up for everyone to see? Now, am I giving your chocolate to dad or for you? You sure? <laughs> okay. Sorry, dad. Fantastic. Now, can anybody, can anybody tell me what that is? Bread. It's plastic bread, actually, this one. Um, we, uh, we have a, a container in our house with lots of plastic food, um, which is one of those things that kids play with when they come around our house. Heidi, you like to play with the plastic food, don't you? When you've been around, we've got all this plastic food. Now, we're going to say this verse together. Are you ready? One, two, three. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it. This is my body. So what does the bread symbolize? The body of Christ. We're going to take communion, aren't we, at the end of this, uh, end of this service a little bit later. But I wonder how often we come to the communion table and we don't treat it with the respect that maybe it's due. Now, I'm sure, you know, we all come and we're all kind of mindful, but it can be so easy, can't it, to come up, take the bread and wine, thank God for what he's done, then go back and sit down again and maybe start chit-chatting with the person next to us. But actually, when we have communion, when we take Jesus' body, it is such a powerful thing because we're remembering Jesus' body broken for us. So when we take communion later, I want us to all be really, really mindful of what it is we're doing, what it is we're taking. Because that uh, simple act of taking that bread cost Jesus everything. So when we take that later, let's be mindful of that. Okay, who's going to come up now? Can we have another one up? Caleb. Okay, can you, find, can you find number three? Can you see number three in there? Let's have a look. I think it might be is it that one, that little one there. You got it? Right, uh, no one will know what it is at the moment. Can you hold it up? Really, really high. Ready? One, two. Ah. So there. Okay, fantastic. I suppose you want some chocolate as well, don't you? Okay, there you go. Now, who can guess what that is? A wine gum. Helen, well done. Okay, yes, it's a wine gum because I couldn't work out how to get wine um, in my egg. Um, and even the really, really small bottles you can buy, which I'm not paying for, um, didn't quite fit in there. So I thought, you know, the next best thing, a wine gum. And I'll tell you something really daft about it. I said to Trish the other day when she went downtown, I said, Trish, I need some wine gums. Can you pick me some up? So she went into, what shop did you go in? Wilkinson's to buy a packet of wine gums. And when she brought them home, guess what was the only color they didn't have in the packet? <laughs> red. So I had to go to another shop to buy a packet of wine gums. They literally, they had no red ones in. They had orange and they had green in abundance, but no, but no red. I mean... The, the, I'm sorry, but the red and the black ones are the best flavors of wine gum anyway. Okay. But why, do you, why, why is the wine gum in there? What's the wine gum symbolizing in a very unusual way? Who can tell me what that's? The blood of Christ. Jesus shed his blood. He actually shed a lot of his blood. And even after he died, they speared his side, didn't they? And blood and water flowed out. Now, it's a really not a, a pleasant thing to think about. And I've been, over the last few weeks, I've been going into some of the local schools and doing the Easter assembly. And it's a very difficult story to tell because it's, it's not pleasant. You know, it, it, we, you know we, we try and sanitize some of these things, but the way Jesus died was not a pleasant way of dying. But his blood washes us and cleans us and cleanses us from our sin. So later on, when we take the wine... Um, or a grape if you're one of, the, one of the children. I just want you to really be challenged to think that this is a wine. We're taking this cup of wine. We're taking this grape. But we're remembering Jesus' blood. We're remembering that when he was on that cross and he bled and he died, he had us on his mind. He did it because he loves us. He did it because it was the only way to make us right with the Father. Now, Helen, do you want to earn a bar of chocolate? Cool. Can you come up here then? Now, you're, you're going you're gonna to pick out. We've got to find number four. Okay, this, can you see that one? That one there. That one. That one there. Can you get that one? 
Fantastic. Now, are you going to hold it up really high as well? You ready? One. Hold it up. Way. Okay. That's it. Well, well done. Now, no, see that? Right. Do you want a bar of chocolate? There you go. Fantastic. Thank you very much. You can go sit back down again. Now, anyone tell me what, what who, who can tell me what this is? What is this? Thorns. Okay, these are thorns. Okay, and they're in sellotape. Because I did a risk assessment and realized that they needed to be in sellotape. Okay? We're going to say the verse together. One, two, three. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorn and put it on his head. And they put a purple robe on him. And the Jews him as they slapped him across the face. Now, I don't know how many people, um, any gardeners here? Put your hand up if you enjoy gardening. Okay, I've got to that age where I'm actually beginning, just beginning to enjoy it. Last year I put some plants in and they're still alive, um, which is amazing. Um, but thorns aren't pleasant. These thorns aren't particularly big. They're on a bush that's just down the road from where I live. Um, I think people wondered what I was doing, because it's a piece of like no man's land, and I was there with my penknife cutting these little thorns off. Um, I think people wondered what, what on earth was going on. But Jesus, the, the thorns would have been thick, long thorns, and they were made into a makeshift crown. And then the crown wasn't delicately placed on his head, it was forced onto his head. Now there's two things going on there. There's the fact that that is a painful form of torture. There is also the fact that that is mockery. That is people, soldiers at the time, disrespecting Jesus. And we often think, don't we, we might watch, um, there's some great um, film adaptations of, of the life of Jesus. And I can remember several years ago going and watching The Passion with a group of people from this church. And it's the only time I've ever left the cinema and the whole cinema was in silence. Nobody said a word. But Jesus went through the torture, and it wasn't just the physical side of it. It was that emotional and that sense of just being completely and utterly abused and mistreated by the people that he created. You know, those thorns were his idea. He created those on the, on the bush, the plant that they would have been there. So when we, when we think of thorns, we just remember that Jesus went through that and not at any point did he speak any retaliation, did he get angry with anyone, did he get cross with anyone. He did it because he was thinking again of us, and he loved us so much that he went through that. Now, is there any more children that want to earn a bar of chocolate? <gasps> One there, quick, come up. Who could tell me what number we're What number are we on? Seven. Sue said, no, we're not on seven. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute, Heidi. One, two, three, one, well, number five. <gasps> How old are you? Five. That's brilliant. Well done. Okay, right. Can you see? Um, that one there. Okay, you're gonna, can I lift you up and hold it and show everybody? You ready? Oh. Oh, okay. Right, Heidi. Is this for mummy or for you? Um, mummy. Oh, that's, do you know what? I'm going to give you two for that. One for you, one for mummy. That's so nice. <laughs> that is so nice. Well done. Thank you. Who can see what that is? It's a piece of wood. Nothing special about it, just a piece of wood. We're going to say this, uh, say this verse together. When they came to a place called the Sutton, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also on the throne. This is just a simple piece of wood that was down the side of my house on the floor. And when I was thinking about the different items that were going to go in there, obviously a piece of wood was something. I was going to put a piece of, uh, I was going to find a cross actually. I wear a wooden, wooden cross around my neck. Um, and, I thought, and I thought, no, I'm just going to put a piece of wood in. Now when we think of the cross, when we think of Jesus being put on the cross, one of the things that I'm always mindful of, there was a great, there's a great story called The Three Trees. I don't know if any of you have ever read it. If you've never read The Three Trees, um, just have a look it, look it up later. But it's an amazing story. But the piece of wood that Jesus was crucified on came from, from what? Where do we get wood from? Where does, what plant grows wood? Trees. Okay. 
Who created trees? Jesus did. Yeah, God did, didn't he? God created trees. And yet he was nailed to something that he created himself. By people he created himself. Now there's a song, isn't there, that said it wasn't the nails that hung him there. I don't know if I get the exact line, but it talks about it was the love that held him on the cross. And whenever, whenever I see a cross, whenever I see this cross, you know, a cross we carried, I had the privilege of um, being in the town at the week, uh, on Friday and, and being down there watching the cross being carried through our town. Jesus made the wood, made the tree that the wood came from and was then nailed to it. And to me, that is just mind-blowing, actually. And I think sometimes we can get so familiar with the story, we can kind of get a bit blasé about it. So let's never, ever lose uh, the power of what Jesus did by being nailed to a piece of wood. Now, we've only got a couple of, a couple of items left. Is there any, anybody that has a... Do you want to come up? Brilliant, you come up, young man. Okay, what number are we on now? Six. Now, you've got to be really careful with number six, okay? So can you very... It's that one there. Can you very, very carefully take that one out? Okay, right. Hold it like that. Right. No, I'm not going to lift you up because you're bigger. Okay, so can you just hold it up like that? Can everybody see what that is? Okay, it's a nail. It's a rusty nail as well. That's why I'm being very careful. Right. Would you like some chocolate? I thought you might. Thank you very much for helping. Well done. Now, just a nail. In fact, it's probably a nail that's a lot smaller than the one that would have been used. This one actually came, I, I, uh, I sent a WhatsApp to my dad. said, Dad, I need an old rusty nail. Um, all mine are small and shiny. Um, and my dad pulled this out of his fence so that I could, <laughs> I could have it. So he does want it back, I think. Um, but what held Jesus to the cross? Nails. Physically, he was held in place by nails, wasn't he? Yeah? And they weren't pleasant nails. Nails aren't nice. Yeah? Who's ever, any of you, any of you uh, and I'm going to be politically correct here, any male or female has ever done any DIY? Okay? Has anyone have ever hit your finger with a nail? It, 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 it hurts, actually. And Jesus, again, it's something we don't like to think about. Jesus actually had these through his hands. He had these on his hands, and they held him to the cross that came from the tree that he'd created. But it wasn't just these that kept him there. What kept him there was you and me, actually, for the people in the world, his love for them. The Bible tells us that he could have called down a legion of angels at any moment. And actually, he could have just obliterated and wiped out all those that were against him. But no, he stayed on that cross. He bled on that cross. He died on that cross because he loves you and he loves me and he loves the world. Now, it was an absolute privilege this morning. We went um, up the hill. And I looked for the rest of you. I don't know where you were. Where was everybody this morning when we were up the hill? It was like, there was a very biblical number this morning. How many of us do you think were up there? Twelve. Okay, both biblical numbers. I'll give you that. Okay, but there were twelve of us. It felt, it was, it was really, really lovely. It really was lovely. And we looked across the whole town. Um, and it, it just, and, 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 and Glyn sort of said about this spirit of like deception uh, that seems to be over a town. But it was a real blessing to, to be up there and to actually be praying for our town and thinking, people need to hear what we know. We've got to be sharing this. This isn't something we kind of, you know, this egg, you know, if I put all the things in it and, and seal it, you'd never know what was in it. Okay? Sophie, if I, if I hid something in there, would you be able to see it? If I, if I, you wouldn't know what was in there, would you? Okay? We've got to take Jesus out of the church. Okay, Jesus loves the church. It was his idea. Okay, But he doesn't want to stay in it. He wants to go out of the church. He wants us to be taking him out where we go. Now, we've got one more item. I need... Ella, do you want to buy a chocolate? Come on. Okay, got one... This is a really easy one now because there's only one thing left. And I'm not, definitely not lifting you up. Okay? What do you think that is? It's a rock. It is. Fantastic. There you go. Have a bar of chocolate. Thank you very much. And if there's any children that didn't get a bar of chocolate, 
see me at the end, and I'll give you a bar of chocolate just for being here this morning. Okay? Really simple. It's just a, it's just a rock. Okay? It's just a little stone that comes from my garden. Okay? We're going to read this together. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. Now, would you not have loved to have been there? I would so love to have been there. If I'd been that angel, I'd have been just sat there like, yeah. (laughs) He ain't in there anymore. (laughs) It's just, it's amazing, isn't it? Jesus died. He had a spear shoved in his side. He was put in a tomb. It was sealed. He was dead. As dead as dead can be. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around anybody dead before. When they're dead, something happens. What happens? When, you, when you're dead, you stop breathing. Okay? Jesus was, to all intents and purposes, his life was ended. But then on the third day, God brings him back. You know, it says in the Bible that the guards that were there, you know, these were seasoned soldiers. They weren't the kind of, you know, people that would have been easily intimidated. They fell into a dead faint. I love that expression, a dead faint. You know, if you're fainting, isn't bad enough, but a dead faint, that's got to be even worse, doesn't it? Okay? But Jesus is no longer in the tomb. And we need to be living like we believe that. Because sometimes, and this isn't a criticism, well, actually, it is a criticism, okay? We live as if Jesus is still dead. He's not. He is alive, and he's in the business of changing lives, and he's in the business of transforming people. But it's no good, people, if we just keep it inside. If we keep it inside, it's just a waste. What does Jesus say before he went back to heaven? What did, what's one of the last things Jesus said to his disciples? Did he say, go back into the town, meet every week together, share what you already know, bless each other, pray for each other, give each other lots of holy hugs, and then come back the following week and do it? Because if that's in your Bible, you're reading one of those really, really, really modern translations, because the Bible I read, it doesn't say that. It says, go into all the world and make what? Disciples. And what's a disciple? A follower. We are to be out making people followers of Jesus. Now, we don't forcibly do that. You don't go up to someone and say, Oi, you're going to follow Jesus. Actually, do you know what? Jesus did it and it worked. He just said, come follow me, and people did. That's because there was something about Jesus that people were attracted to. We need to be the kind of people that people look at us and think, I want what they've got. But sometimes... I think people look at us and think, I don't want what they've got. Okay? But we need to be the kind of people that are telling others. And you know what? I'm going to speak now to all the younger ones, okay? It doesn't matter whether you're three or 103. Okay? We need to be sharing Jesus. Today we remember him coming back to life. We remember his resurrection. But we need to be living every day in the light of that resurrection. And remember that he is alive and he's given us a job to do. And we're to go out into the world. And guess what? Bushmead, Luton, your place of work, your local supermarket, the school you work at, the college you work at, the office you work at, wherever that may be, that is a place that needs to know Jesus. And our job is to go and do it. The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. The peace of the risen Christ be always with you. Let's offer one another a sign of the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Bless you. Peace be with you, Chris. Bless you. (laughs) We're doing it again.
Peace be with you, Juliet. Bless you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Cheryl. Bless you. Peace the Lord be with you, Keiko. Bless you. Peace be with you, darling. I'm going to get the communion ready. Peace the Lord be with you, Jenna. Bless you. Bless you.